So, um, so hang on, folks. There's just a couple of a couple of talks left. It's been a great day, but a long day. And um, you know, I think we've, you know, I, I just want to give a shout out to our to our cardio cardiac vascular cardiovascular surgery colleagues because I think you can't overestimate the expertise that's been, um, you know, in, in this room right now from the previous speakers as well as the panelists. And our patients are lucky to have access to these world. Um, world famous and world expert um, cardiovascular surgeons. So uh, shout out to you guys. So we're going to talk about a little bit of a, of a blunter tool. And we, the whole day has been, and the afternoon has been, the transition from biology to uh, synthetics. And I think in general, when you think about uh, congenital aortopathies, the, the transition from biology to synthetics, the best transition is a suture line as opposed to a metal stent. But there may be a role for some stents, and there may be some developments that we should keep an eye on in, in the future. So um, our division does get uh, some unrestricted education grant support through stent graft manufacturers. So the outline of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about the current status of, of stent grafts for uh, aortopathies. We'll talk about some of the specific graft and technical issues, and maybe some of the future design considerations that may improve the outcomes with this less invasive therapy. So let's talk about degenerative thoracic aneurysms first of all. First of all. So an isolated, run-of-the-mill degenerative thoracic aneurysm in that area, stent graft repair is, for all intents and purposes, for most patients, has really replaced open surgical repair for degenerative aneurysms. Um, these, these risks probably overstate some of the risks, but low mortality, low risk of stroke, lower risk of spinal cord ischemia compared to an open thoracotomy for a, de for a degenerative thoracic aneurysm and low rates of one of the catastrophic complications of stent grafts and congenital aortopathies, which is retrograde type A dissection. However, even in degenerative aneurysms, because the aorta continues to degenerate, there's up to a 10% risk of re-intervention, most commonly because of attachment site leaks or endoleaks. The biology doesn't stop. The, 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 the aneurysmal or the, or the um, dilatory capacity of the aorta continues, and the stent can only dilate to a certain, to a certain size. Now, what about, um, what about um, aortopathies? And our next speaker, Dr. Shalab, will speak about this, but this is her work looking at the, uh, looking at the Gentac um, registry and looking at um, aortopathies who have had stent graft repairs. And uh, admittedly, it's a small number of patients, but the, di but the outcomes are very different compared to degenerative aneurysms. So these patients had a medium follow-up of two years, so a relatively short follow-up, uh, the, the most... The, Longest follow-up was seven years. Reintervention rate was 42% after an endovascular repair with a thoracic stent graft, so a huge reintervention rate. And some of these reinterventions were massive and, and life-threatening. Open conversion with thoracic endograft explant in 22% of, of, of patients and retrograde type A dissection, which we'll talk a little bit more about in, in a second in, in a number of patients as well. So these reinterventions were not small uh, reinterventions. When we talked a little, we heard a little bit uh, previously about guidelines, and uh, this is the Canadian do guideline document that was that was referenced. Um, and just looking at degenerative thoracic aneurysms with appropriate anatomy and etiology, be treated with thoracic endovascular repair. However, open repair is considered the first option with patients with a known connective tissue disorder, and that's that persists among among the guidelines worldwide. So. That doesn't mean that endografts aren't used for, de, uh, for congenital aortopathies. In, in the current practice at a lot of our centers, high-risk patients, so what do I mean by high-risk patients? High-risk for an open intervention, but maybe high-risk because of their hemorrhagic status. They're bleeding to death. Maybe you want to do a bridge to more definitive therapy, um, so an acute presentation. Morale spoke about surgical graft landing zones. One of the, one of the ways to get biology out of the way is to put the graft into Dacron or into synthetic material. And this was a patient where the thoracic endograft is into an elephant trunk. Of course, distally, it's an aorta, so that biology synthetic interface will still be, still be an issue. And as I mentioned, if you have a patient who's trying to, trying to die on us, then an endograft might be a short-term bridge to more definitive surgical repair and get them into a more physiologic attractive state to undergo a larger operation. There are some problems with endografts when you think simply about it. There is a chronic, out, or a chronic outward radial force on stent grafts. That's what keeps them in place. They're, they're, they're expanding outward against this biologically active aorta. 
it, the stent can only um, expand to a certain size, whereas the expansory ability of the aorta is unlimited. So you can lose that seal and create endoleaks or perfusion of the aneurysm. This can lead to device migration and erosion. There can be uh, what, are, what is called stent graft-induced new entry tears, which we'll talk in, about in a second. And we've already referred a little bit to retrograde type A dissections, which we'll talk, talk about as well. So on your left is uh, basically what's, what's termed an endoleak, and a 1B endoleak means it's at the distal aspect of the, uh, of the endograft, and that seal has been lost, and now there's back perfusion into the aneurysm cavity. In the middle two panels is, is a new, new entry tear where a stent graft has been used to successfully repair a dissection, and then the outward radial force of the distal stent has basically busted through the dissection flap, such as there's a loss of, um, loss of um, seal distally. And then the catastrophic complication of a retrograde type A dissection um, in a very fragile aorta is on, is on your right. So some of the technical aspects when we use endovascular um, technology in um, aortopathies, minimal oversizing, not to exceed 10%, is very important. That's the size mismatch between the size of the, of the graft versus the size of the aorta. We actually want the graft to be a little bigger than the aorta to have that fit that fixation. Um, we want long and normal diameter landing zones, preferably synthetic material, but that's not always or often the case. Um, if we have a choice, there are some stent grafts with less radial force, whereas in the abdominal aorta, we may use a, a molding balloon to fixate the, uh, the graft in place. We would avoid that, especially the more proximal you go and, and with congenital aortopathies. We have to remember access site complications, especially in Ehlers-Danlos um, type 4. Getting the stent graft up, there's issues with respect to access site and femoral access uh, complications. And as has been said in multiple talks, any intervention is not a definitive cure. And there's close, close surveillance, both for the complications of our procedure, but also for subsequent uh, degeneration. So I mentioned um, stent graft oversizing. And let's talk about uh, retrograde type A dissections for a second. So the mother, mother registry is a multi-centered um, registry looking at uh, TVAR. Uh, for a number of pathologies and looked at the, uh, the impact of oversizing of the stent graft and the incidence of retrograde type A dissections. And you can see the density plot that the patients who did suffer from a retrograde type A dissection were more apt to have more oversizing of, of the stent graft. The average oversizing with those with the retrograde dissection was 22%. Uh, the average oversizing in patients who did not have a dissection was 10%. So for every 1% increase in oversizing above 9%, there was a relative risk of um, aortic dissection increased by 14%. So that's why we really try to keep oversizing to at most 10%. Why is oversizing important? Well, really, it's a surrogate to radial force. And if you look at this graph, you can see that, that in basically a linear way, the more you oversize the aorta, the more the radial force that the stent will apply. But also importantly, look at the configuration of the stent and, and the peak and the valley of, of those stents with the more oversizing and the more compressed, and that transfers um, um, forces to the aorta in different, different aspects. Um, here's um, just an, a, an example. Um, on, the page, on, your, on your left, there's a 26 millimeter graft or endograft in a 24 millimeter aorta representing an 8% oversizing. And just by small alterations, you've got the same graft now in a 20 millimeter thoracic aorta measuring a 30% oversizing. Going from a 10 to 20% increase in oversizing increases radial force by 64%. So that just exponentially increases with the degree of oversizing. So that's why it's a very important factor when we're choosing the size of our endografts. Not only the size of the endografts, but not all endografts are the same. And this is just a, a, a hodgepodge of some of the graphs out there. The stent design is different. Those are those squiggly, squiggly lines. Um, I don't know if this is a pointer. Yep. You can see at the top end, some of the graphs actually have barbs that fixate into the aorta. And in a fragile aorta, that might be problematic. We talk about bare metal stents proximally. Some stents have those. Some, uh, some do not. And that uh, can be problematic in a fragile aorta as well. What is the role of a proximal bare stent? And if you get 10 vascular surgeons and cardiac surgeons in the room, you'll probably get 11 opinions about whether, whether a bare stent will dictate proximal complications. But again, getting back to this registry where they looked at uh, the influence of bare metal stents, 
Um, air stents were used most commonly in these patients, in 60 per 60% of patients. In this, in this series, at least, there was no difference in retrograde type A dissection, so I think, although I think a lot of people's bias is that a bare stent may make a patient more at risk of a retrograde dissection with an aortopathy. And this registry, just a caveat, this registry was primarily a non-aortopathic registry. We talked about stent graft-induced uh, new entry tears, and that's based on the radial force and the dissection flap. Um, in a, in a or, or aortic dissection, and you can see that the initial um, CT here shows that a good seal, dissection flap, and then the, the radial force of the stent graft basically busts open the dissection flap, and then you get back perfusion of the aneurysm. Um, how can we prevent that? Um, there are some, you know, f f surgeons and physicians get pretty innovative. There are some reports about decreasing the radial force of the distal aspect of the stent graft, and this is one case report from some, uh, some surgeons that a lot of people will know in Germany. So this was a 33-year-old Marfans patient who presented with a symptomatic dissection, and the way they treated this patient, they were worried about the distal, distal re-entry tear, so they basically... Um, deployed their graft and took out the distal stent so that this is just fabric with no radial force, put a marker on the end, which you can just see a little clip right here that, that represents the distal end of the fabric, and there's really no radial force being applied to the dissection flap down below. So the good news is the patient's unlikely to get a stent graft-induced new entry tear. The bad news is with the lack of any radial force that this, this seal is extremely tenuous and this actually proved to be a bridge to a more definitive, definitive therapy. Um, so can future considerations, because we don't have a good stent graft um, with, with optimal radial force, especially for, for aortopathies, the radial force should be minimized, but should be sufficient to provide adequate sealing and prevent migration. And that's a delicate balance. Radial force depends on a number of things. It depends on oversizing, but it also depends on the stent height, the diameter, of the, of, the, of the wire, the wire thickness, the number of peaks, the axial length, and the material composition. And there's been a number of studies looking at, looking at the composition of the metal stent itself and how that translates into, um, uh, translates into radial force. And some of these stent design considerations going force, forward, the force per peak of, of, uh, of each stent is the radial force divided by the number of peaks. And this is a measure of the distribution of the force at each peak of the stent, so a very focal area of radial force, whereas the radial pressure is, is the radial force over the area of the stent, which is more of a distribution of the force along the aorta. And these two specific design features can affect seal migration and complications. So, in conclusion, um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a role, although we have to be somewhat cautionary and selective in using endograft endografts in these, in these patients. Close surveillance is mandatory. There will be re-interventions, and um, you know, perhaps there will be some improvement in the technology, but it remains to be seen. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. That, that was a great talk. Uh, Tom had trained me as a, as a resident when he was a, was his vascular surgeon in London, and uh, he used to always remind me that you know anyone can be a heart surgeon. The heart just pumps blood to the soul, and the soul was the aorta. And you know he he told everyone this, and so much so that his little kids would you know would draw with sideway chalk uh, on the on the, on the sidewalks. They draw aortas. <laughs> so. It's fabulous. Um, listen, uh, you know, Tom, you guys, with Morale and Tom, and your group here, you guys do fabulous, have fabulous results with thoracoabdominals. Um, and, but, you know, in, in most places, they're very morbid operations. And, and the patients, you know, they, 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 it's a big operation. Um, and uh, particularly for some of these uh, heritable uh, aortopathy patients, um, you know, trying to avoid that thoracotomy. Um, you know, can really save a lot of morbidity. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were with some of the endovascular techniques and maybe some hybrid approaches in terms of hybrid approaches on the top end and on the bottom end and maybe connecting the two with stent grafts. So I was wondering if you wanted to share your thoughts yeah, about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you spoke to it earlier, Mike, about a, about a, t about a team approach, right? And, it, you know, the, these, you know, the care of these patients from a surgical aspect, let alone the biologic and the medical aspect, is becoming more and more complicated, which is good because we have more options, right? And we understand a little bit the pros and cons of different approaches. And um, there's not one approach that's perfect for all patients. 
it's very difficult for one individual to have all the skills and the knowledge for all of these features. So, it, you know, a team approach that we've heard about today from Montreal, from Ottawa, from London, from Toronto, I mean, that's, that's, the, way, that's the way to go. Um, these patients need to be reviewed by practitioners with all the skill set, not, not saying that one practitioner has to have every, every skill set. Um, I think it's, you know, we hear about personalized medicine and selective therapy. That's what it is. Each individual patient is, is, is different. On paper, they may look similar, but they're, but they're different. Um, durability is more important depending on the patient's durability and their age and their life expectancy. So we have to sort of predict the future um, and look at, look at durability. But, you know, we can't, we can't compromise and optimize durability by putting them through too much if they never, you know, put them at risk of ever achieving the advantage of durability. So um, it's, it's, it's as, as you do at your center, as, as Mark does at his center, I mean, these are, these, are, these are complex issues and it gets a number of people in the room to talk about the different options. Um, more and more, we're doing a little bit of each, you know, a little bit of open, a little bit of endo. And um, that seems to work, but often it's not the end of the story and the surveillance is, is important. So.